So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app, turn to the book of Philemon. And I'm actually going to read the whole thing for us. There's only 25 verses. And so you can go home today and tell your friends, I read an entire book of the Bible in church today. So let's do that together. This letter is from Paul, a prisoner for preaching the good news about Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy. I am writing to Philemon, our beloved co-worker, and to our sister Athia, and to our fellow soldier architects, and to the church that meets in your house. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God when I pray to you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That is why I am boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it is the right thing for you to do. But because of your love, I prefer simply to ask you, consider this a request from me, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past, but now he is very useful to both of us. I am sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. I want to keep him here with me while I'm in these chains for preaching the good news, and he would have helped me on your behalf. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus for a while, so you can have him back forever. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now, he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. And I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. What a great way to encourage someone. Yes, my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. I am confident as I write this letter that you will do what I ask and even more. One more thing. Please prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that God will answer your prayers and let me return to you soon. The pastor, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. So to Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Well, isn't that a challenge? And by the way, I'm coming to visit, so make sure to do that. That's awesome. I really do believe that this is a great example of the kingdom of God in action. And if you're unfamiliar with the term kingdom of God, I would say it like this. Perhaps you could think of it as a rehearsal for heaven. Because ultimately, when we are with God, and when He is ruling and reigning, the amount of love and grace and compassion will be overflowing, will be abundant. And the kingdom of God on earth gives us the same opportunity to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to be able to have that same kind of preparation for what heaven could look like. Today what I want to talk to you about is this, that the kingdom of God is built on grace. Now grace is a gift from God that is not deserved and cannot be earned. It refers both to salvation 
and to the ongoing blessings that we receive as His children. You know, Paul brings up grace a couple times. In verse 3, he introduces this idea of grace and peace to you. And at the end, again, he says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace is the ultimate building block of the letter. Because without grace, Philemon doesn't have a chance. Onesimus doesn't have a chance for this example of the kingdom of God to be at play. So what is grace? How else could this be said? There's a couple quotes that I have for you, and the first one is from author A.W. Tozer, and it says, Grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits upon the undeserving. Its use to us, sinful men, is to save us and make us sit together in heavenly places to demonstrate to the ages the exceeding riches of God's kindness to us in Jesus Christ. Brady Boyd says it like this, Graciousness is when heaven penetrates earth. It's being kind and loving and gentle, even when the person you are dealing with deserves anger or ridicule or scorn. Now, grace is also important to us here at North Park. It is actually one of our core values, and this is how North Park describes the core value of grace. Embracing each other, regardless of life situation or brokenness, as we journey towards life transformation. And so I present to you kind of the, the main idea that I want to talk to you about today, is that the kingdom of God is built on grace. Now, normally, when someone gets up to teach a concept or to preach, typically it'll be kind of a three-point sermon. Here's idea number one, idea number two, idea number three. And as I was approaching this passage, though, I thought, you know what? What if we did something a little bit different and actually explore some stories of how grace is actually played out in the real world, both in Bible times as well as... Today. So the first story that I want to share is the story of this runaway slave named Onesimus. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the word slave, I think of something pretty brutal. But you think about when the British Empire, when in the early days of the American um, oversight of uh, their government, slavery was a big deal. But it was different than the kind of slavery that we're talking about in the Bible. In those days, a better way to say it would actually be bond servant. And some translations actually talk about bond servants. The idea that as a slave, you need something. Maybe you're in debt that you, you can't repay. And so you agree to work for someone for a period of time. And at the end of the contract, you will be free of that obligation. So he's free of that contract once it was completed. Now that's very different than the British and the Americans going to other countries, particularly in Africa, kidnapping people, taking them away from their homes, bringing them to a new land, forcing them to work and giving them no opportunity to achieve freedom in any way. Something else that is interesting to point out about this is that the name Onesimus actually means useful or profitable. And now this was a common name for slaves or bond servants in this era. Now at some point though, Onesimus decided to reject this idea of being useful and profitable and run away from home. Now this was a big deal, not just because he broke the contract obligations that he had to Philemon, but also because he very likely had to steal either money or property or something to be able to actually sustain life away from Philemon's household. Now, this is where things get really interesting. You have Onesimus in the home of Philemon in Colossae. You have Paul in prison in Rome. These two places are almost 2,000 kilometers apart from each other. 
and it likely would have taken Onesimus up to 262 hours to arrive on foot. Now, if I was running away, I probably would stop around 100 hours away. But Onesimus decided to go just a little bit further. Now, we don't know the situation in which they met, but what we do know is that Paul and Onesimus meet at some time. And over the course of this interaction, Paul leads Onesimus to a faith in Christ, and he's mentored by Paul. And we don't know, again, how long this was, but it was long enough that Paul was able to see a lasting change in Onesimus that he highlighted in verse 11, where he comments about how he wasn't useful in the past, but now he is useful. Now that he's come to Jesus, he's actually starting to live out the meaning of his name. Now, at this time, Paul was writing letters. And one of the letters that he wrote was to the church in Colossae, the city where Philemon lived. And in your Bibles, it would be referred to as the book of Colossians. And so he sends Onesimus along for the ride to deliver both letters to the Colossian church and this personal letter to Philemon. Now, I can only imagine how awkward and risky it would be for Onesimus to go back to the master that he abandoned and the person that he stole from. To say the least, it would require a lot of strength to be able to do that. But Onesimus was a changed man. He had been reconciled to God, to whom he committed the greatest offense. And now his mission is to go and be reconciled to someone on earth that he had committed an offense to. Philemon very likely was angry at what was done to him. And as a master, he had a right to very strictly punish. He didn't have to give grace. However, Philemon was also a man that had been reconciled to God. He knew as well that his debt of sin and his level of offense to God was so great that he couldn't pay for it on his own. And so he was also a changed man. In verses 6 and 7, Paul highlights the fact that Philemon is actually known for his kindness, for his love, for his graciousness. And Paul even says at the end of the letter in verse 21 that he believes that Philemon will choose grace over punishment. Now, I wish I could tell you what Philemon decides to do, but that is not in the scriptures, and there is no history that I could find that actually said what Philemon decided to do. But the next few stories that I want to share with you, we do have a full picture and an ending to the story. The next story I want to share is written by a man named Timothy Paul Jones. Now, I'm going to read some of it, but I'm also going to just paraphrase some of this as well. Now, Timothy and his wife decided to adopt a little girl into their family. This girl was eight years old when she came into their home, and she had actually been adopted before, but for whatever reason, the other adoptive parents decided to dissolve the adoption and say, no, we we can't handle it this child. And so Timothy Jones and his family brought this little girl into their home. And as as they're getting to know each other, Timothy started to figure some things out about the situation. One of the things that he found out is that whenever this family decided to go to Disney World, they would take their biological children with them, but leave their adopted daughter back home with a family friend. Now, the girl felt as though this was because of her bad behavior. Whether that or not that's the case, we're not sure. But Timothy was convicted with this fact, and he wanted to show a different kind of life to this girl that he had adopted. And so he made the point of scheduling a family trip to Disney World. 
Now, supposedly the happiest place on earth. Now, I would say probably North Park Stratford is the happiest place on earth. But so they go to Disney World. And in preparing to go to Disney World, this girl's behavior was just simply out of control. She was stealing things. She was lying. She was misbehaving. And so one day, leading up to the trip, Kim goes up to her daughter to talk to her, and the girl says this, I know what you're going to do. You are not going to take me to Disney World, are you? And then he's like, well, maybe that would be not such a bad idea. I don't want to really reward this kind of behavior, but and he decided to give a different response. And he asked her this, is this trip something we're doing as a family? He said, yes. He, he, next, he asked her, are you a part of this family? She says, yes. And this is what he says, and this is powerful. And then you're going with us. Sure. There may be some consequences to help you remember what's right and what's wrong. But you are part of our family, and we are not leaving you behind. Fast forward to the story, they go to Disney World. And they're having a good time. He's starting to see the attitude in his daughter change. And so he goes up to her and he asks, how was your first day? And this is what she says, Daddy, I finally got to go to Disney World. But it wasn't because I was good. It's because I'm yours. There is nothing like seeing such a powerful truth that can be understood and expressed by a child. God's grace is that good. Even when we lie, we cheat, we steal, He doesn't give up on us. He invites us into His eternal family and gives us the opportunity to grow and learn with other imperfect members of the family. Now, at times, there's discipline involved in that. But there's a big difference, and parents will know this, with disciplining your child out of love as opposed to giving punishment out of anger. And this is exactly what God does for us as well. He gives us His discipline sometimes out of love, but God does not punish us out of His anger. Now, the last story I want to share is actually one that happened to me personally. In my early teens, my dad lived in downtown Toronto. And so, one summer, I brought my cousin Chris with me to go and spend a week at my dad's house. Now, there was this restaurant that Chris really, really liked and wanted to go back to. So, we decided that one day when my dad was at work, that we would go and we would take the journey to go and try out this restaurant. Now, here I am riding high, like maybe 14, 15 years old, excited about being able to experience a big city life without the supervision of a parent. So we take the bus and we arrive at the restaurant, and I was completely underwhelmed. It seemed as though a car had driven into this place the day before we got there. There was no, nothing really on the walls. It looked like it was just drywall. The, the furniture in there was all like outdoor lawn furniture. And this wasn't really the greatest part of town. And I'm thinking, Chris, why did you bring me here? He said, don't worry, the food is really good. So, we sit down. We get a menu, and this is all food that I am completely unfamiliar with. I didn't know what to order. Now, Chris points out how good the butter chicken is. I'm like, butter what? I like butter, and I like chicken, so let's see how that goes. And let me tell you this, church, my life was changed. It will never be the same. And any time you want to bring butter chicken to a potluck, please do. 
the texture, the taste, the story. Talk about Jesus, not about butter chicken. We enjoy our meal. We're having a good time together, having a good conversation. Then the meal ends. And the next part is something that I wasn't used to doing at this time, and that was paying for the meal. That's usually the thing that the, um, the adults do. And so Chris and I are here on our own. And so I pull out my debit card. I swipe it. I punch in my pen. And the dreaded message comes up. Insufficient funds. I look in my wallet. There's nothing. I look at Chris. Hey, cousin, do you have any money? No. Apparently, he didn't even think about money to get a bus ticket back home. So we're really stuck at this point. And this was the kind of place where I felt like if I didn't pay soon, I was going to be the next meal. And I really didn't want to know what Butter Jordan would taste like. But then a man comes up to us. Wait a second. I thought we were the only people in this restaurant. And he says, I overheard that you don't have any money. He pulls out his credit card and he pays the bill. That's the kind of generosity we don't see very often. This man obviously had no expectation that these two irresponsible teenagers would ever pay him back. But that's great. The food had to be paid for by someone. We didn't have the money, and so someone else decided to step in. The system, the laws of cause and effect, changed. You usually, you don't pay, you don't get. But we were able to experience this meal. But in the same way, in all of our lives, if we are, when we are at the end of our life, and we're meeting God face to face, and we show all of our actions to Him, hoping that our good deeds will outweigh our bad deeds, that's the message that's going to come up for us as well. Insufficient funds. Romans six twenty three says it like this: For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's also cool to point out that the word grace that we are looking at in Philemon and the word gift here in Romans are actually from the same root word. Part of how I came to this definition that grace is a free gift. This is how the kingdom of God is built on grace. God's grace it's custom made for each and every one of us for where we are at, for the situation that we are in, in order to bring us to the place where we need to be. Onesimus received grace from God that allowed him to live out his identity of useful and profitable. He also gave Onesimus the strength to do the right thing in returning to Philemon regardless of the consequences. The little girl received grace by understanding that no matter what she does, she will always be a part of the family. And Chris and I received grace by having our meal paid for. Now this leaves the big question. Everybody in this room, I ask you this. How do you need grace? We all need it in some way. In some form, the good deeds, bad deeds account of our lives is going to come up with insufficient funds. How is the grace of God going to find itself in your life? Are you maybe here exploring faith and you need to be introduced to that grace for the sake for the first time? To be introduced to the love of God, the salvation of God? If that's you, I encourage you to come and and talk to myself, to Pastor Kirk, to anyone that has a prayer name tag on, and we would love to introduce you to the grace of God in that way. But for many of us, as people that have been in the church for a long time, for people that have accepted Christ, 
years ago, sometimes it is really easy to forget the grace that we've been given. Sometimes it's really easy for us to start to falsely assume that we can do it on our own. And so I just really hope and pray that all across this room, and myself included, that our attitudes would change, that we would see God's grace for what it is, and be open to the work that God wants to do in each of our lives. Now, one way that you could do this is by taking some quiet time this week, and I really do encourage you to do this. Take some quiet time this week. Maybe get a pad of paper and just think about or, or ask God, God, tell me some of the ways that you've shown me grace. And maybe write some of those things down. So when you're starting to see pride bubble up, when you're start, starting to see self-reliance bubble up, that may be a humble reminder of the grace that we all need. We're